In our series about the end times, we have dealt with various aspects of that which is yet to come. We have talked about the second coming of Christ as He promised He would come, as the Word of God uh, says that He would come in the Old Testament and in the New. Uh, We can't believe the Bible uh, if we can't believe that He's coming again. And if we don't believe He's coming again, we simply don't believe the Bible. The Bible teaches it and presents it. And there's also an aspect uh, of the end times uh, that we have, and we're going to talk about that today. It's Judgment Day, the Judgment Day. Now, what I'm going to do this morning is to present the judgment day in its most generic sense. I realize that there is a judgment for the saved and a judgment for the lost, and that there's various different settings and timings of judgments uh, given more in detail uh, in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation. But I'm going to present the judgment day in its generic sense as Jesus himself taught it, and we come to John chapter 5 and verse 22. And the idea of the judgment day is something that is all through the Word of God. In John chapter 5, verse 22 through 29, Jesus is speaking, and He says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself." and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to gain a greater understanding of the coming judgment day. For it's in Jesus' name we ask, amen. The great truths of the Bible are many, but this particular truth is found in the Old Testament and in the New, and this period of time in which we now live is the arena in which we behave, in which we function, in which we make choices and do works, good or bad. And these eventually are all going to be evaluated by a holy and just God. There is no other truth more clearly and more often represented in Scripture than the judgment. We find it all the way back in Genesis, and we find it all the way through the Revelation. And it's hard to go anywhere in the Bible and not find in that place or somewhere close by at least the concept of us being evaluated before God. And it is taught clearly in the Bible that part of the end times, part of what is going to come at the end of this thing we call life, this thing we call the world, that we're going to be judged uh, by Jesus Christ. Now, all religions of the world, in some way or another, acknowledge something very similar to a judgment or an evaluation. You know, even atheists, deep down in their hearts, they seem to know that one day they're going to be evaluated. And I think that's why sometimes they're so angry, because they're denying the obvious. Life has no meaning if there's not someone greater than us who's going to say, yes, that's good, or no, that's bad, or reward or punish as the need may be. We long for justice. We long for what is right. We have a sense of what is right. Uh, Listen, uh, it has been said by philosophers and, and thinkers that if there is no God, there's no way to... Uh, authoritatively say that even murder is wrong. Because uh, in the animal world, uh, animal kills animal all the time, sometimes for competition, sometimes for food, and they are morally uh, uh, innocent. Uh, They're just acting on instinct. Uh, Why should we have the concept of evil unless we are something higher than animals, made in the image of God with an understanding of right and wrong? We know that there is going to be a time in which we're going to stand before God to give an account of our lives. It is not only uh, in the Christian religion, but it is in the collective culture of mankind. 
Now, I want to bring an outline. First of all, the judge of the judgment. Who is going to be the judge? Now, if I am going to be assessed or evaluated or judged, I want to make sure I know who's going to do the judging. And I would hope that that person is righteous. I would hope that person is just. I would hope that person is knowledgeable and fair uh, and would, would deal with things as, as according to what is justice. Now, the Bible says that the judge will be God's own son. Uh, this is made clearly in the Bible where he says, The father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. Now, let's just look at that. All judgment. All judgment. Every human being throughout all time, and no one else is going to judge them except Jesus Christ. He is going to be the judge himself. The second person of the Trinity is going himself to be the judge. Now, that's only fitting because he is the one who paid the price of sin. He is the one who lived a sinless life. So he is the one who could cast the stone. He is the only one who could take God the Father with one hand and man with the other hand and bring them together over himself. So he is righteous to be the judge. Uh, the Apostle Paul preached this truth to a crowd of Greek intellectuals. Uh, these were idol worshipers and skeptics, but here's what he told them in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. He said, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead." Now, when the Apostle Paul was preaching a gospel message to lost intellectual Greeks, he said that Jesus Christ is going to be the one who will judge the world. He told them, Jesus is going to judge your life. Now, that is preaching the gospel. Part of the gospel message is preaching about Jesus being the judge, and he will judge everyone according to righteous judgment. And that brings us to this next point. Uh, the jurisdiction of the judgment. Well, the jurisdiction is, is, is large. It is uh, comprehensive. Uh, all people, every person, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There is not a single individual in the collective history of mankind who will not be assessed and judged by Jesus Christ. The small and the great, every man, all, uh, we found this all over the Bible. Kings and rulers will be judged. Paupers and peasants will be judged. Men will be judged. Women will be judged. Boys and girls, all races, all kindred, all tongues, all ethnicities, all backgrounds for all time. Everyone, including you and I, will stand in person before Jesus Christ and have our lives evaluated by Him. His jurisdiction is over the whole world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we find this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, the Bible says this. It's everybody. It's before Jesus. And we're going to be evaluated by him, whether it be good or bad. Now, here's the emotional impact that this should have to us. That judgment day is going to be according to how we make it. It is up to us. The basis upon which we are judged is going to be His righteousness. But the things that He will judge is up to us to perform in our lives. So if the judgment goes well or not so well, that is up to us. Now let's understand something right off the bat, and I want to make this very clear. The judgment that we have when we stand before Christ is not to determine whether or not we go to heaven or hell. That is determined now when we accept Jesus Christ or if we reject Jesus Christ. If we accept Jesus Christ, that judgment is made at that time and you are headed to heaven. But now, how you live is to be evaluated according to His righteousness. 
And so now let's look at the justness of the judgment. The justness of the judgment. Now, we have a judicial system, and it is unfair. Now, the reason I can say that is even the best judicial system, if ours was the best, and I don't think that it is, but if our justice system was the best in all the world, it would still be an unjust system. And the reason it is an unjust system is because people are flawed. Juries can be deceived. Lawyers can uh, uh, get a man uh, pronounced innocent when he's guilty, and, and a, a prosecutor can make sure a man is called guilty when he was really innocent. A judge does not know everything. The jury does not know everything. Uh, justice can sometimes be uh, 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 done wrongly because of the flaws that are innate, not only in the system, but in the people who are in it. And listen, when you think about it, even if you have a good system, the good system is only good if the people in it are good. And since people are flawed, I can say this without fear of contradiction. There is no completely just judicial system in the world and never has been. So the justness of this judgment is going to be different than any just, just judgment that the world has ever seen. Uh, John chapter 5 and verse 30 uh, Jesus is speaking and he said, I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just. Now, if I'm going to stand before a judge, I want to be comforted with the fact that he's just. I'm going to be treated fairly. I'm going to be treated justly. My judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the father, which hath sent me. Now, going way back to the Old Testament, the concept of the justness of God is uh, reinforced throughout. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, uh, the Bible says, He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Just and right is He. Is he. So when God gave the, the law to Moses and he gave it to the children of Israel, uh, they were reminded that God is holy, he is just, and he is going to be just all the time. Uh, in the book of Job, uh, they had a lot of dialogue, they had a lot of uh, give and take. Uh, some philosophy was shared, some ideas were shared, some thoughts were given. But one of the things that were, were, was asked, uh, as we see in the book of Job in chapter 8, verse 3, there is a rhetorical question that is asked. And the answer uh, is, is obviously a no answer. The question is this, doth God pervert judgment or doth the Almighty pervert justice? Now, all of the men who were there in that circle of dialogue would have said no. God cannot pervert justice. Uh, he cannot uh, be unjust. Uh, he cannot pervert judgment. And so we know that the, the justness of the judgment comes down to this. God, who cannot do anything except that which is right, He knows you. He knows you. He knows you and He knows me. And He knows all about it. Listen, if God is going to be just, He has to be holy but he also has to be omniscient. He has to be someone who knows everything. There's always extenuating circumstances. If somebody stole something because they were starving and they thought they might die if they didn't take something and they hated doing it, but they had to take something in order to live, God's going to look at that a whole lot differently than somebody who stole something from someone else because he hated them and, and didn't think they ought to have it and he coveted it. There's, those are two different things. Now, both may have been wrong, but both, one is understandable and, and the other is, is a, a, a more grave situation. Listen, God knows about those kind of things. He knows what struggles you had. He knows what fights you put up. He knows what fight you may not have put up when you should have put up one. He knows what you may have been talked into, and He knows what you did on your own. He knows the things that happened to you. And he knows the things that you cause to happen. And he has all the understanding in the world for that. And he is just. God will not pervert judgment. Now, here's what I believe in connection with this, the, the justness of God. I believe in my heart of hearts that since God is just, and he is, that nobody, nowhere is getting away with anything. Every crime will be punished. Every theft 
will be addressed. Every inequity will be reconciled. Every wrong will be righted. I believe that those who think they've gotten away with something have not gotten away with anything. There is going to be a payday someday for every crime, every wrong that is committed. I believe that because if that doesn't happen, then that means that injustice prevailed, wrong won. I don't believe God's going to have a world and a universe where wrong wins, where injustice continues. Now, it happens now. For a period of time, there's great injustice, and it happens for what seems to be a long time. Do you realize that right now while I'm speaking, right now while I'm speaking, There are people languishing in prison who were not guilty of the crime that they were convicted of. And they know it. And they're sitting in jail, innocent of that crime. They may have done other things, but they were innocent of the crime that they were convicted of. And they are sitting in prison, rotting away. Do you realize that people have been executed for crimes that later it was found out that someone else had done that and they were executed for it? I don't believe a holy God's going to let that slide. I don't believe a holy God is just going to say, well, that's how things go. I believe that eternity will correct the things that happen in time. I believe that God is just, the justness of the judgment. And here's what it comes down to for you and I in this life. All of us, if there was only God's justice, if that's all that existed, all of us would be condemned. All of us would go to hell. But I am glad, I am happy today, that God's justness is not the only thing that God is. God is also love, and He's also merciful. And so Jesus Christ came down to take our sin upon Himself. And so we come now to the results of the judgment. Let's let's look at the results of His judgment. The results of the judgment of God will be heaven for the righteous and hell for the unrighteous. And in addition to that, there will be levels of reward in heaven and levels of degrees of punishment in hell. The reason we find this is there are passages that teach that. It has to do with the idea of if you work harder, you'll receive a greater reward. And the Bible says that there are those who would receive the greater damnation. Now, if we use the word greater, then we're talking about a scale. We're talking about the concept that some punishments will not be as bad as other punishments because some sins are not going to be seen as bad as other sins. Now, when you think about it, Jesus preached over these cities and he said, woe unto you, Chorazin, woe unto you. And he talked about them and he said, because you have had great light and the things that you have seen and yet you have rejected, you have not believed. And he said, it'll be more tolerable for, for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you in the day of judgment. Now, what Jesus was saying here is that part of the judgment is how much light have you had? How much opportunity have you had and squandered and not listened to? But the results of the judgment, John three thirty six, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, the greatest part of what happens in the end times is there is going to be a determination for who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And this determination is all based, all based on one thing. What did you do with Jesus Christ? Did you accept him or did you not? And the Bible says those that received him will be saved. Now let's look at some synonyms for saved. Synonyms, things in the Bible that also mean the same thing as saved. Uh, Born again, redeemed, regenerated, washed, reconciled, justified, made new, atoned for, made righteous, delivered, Children of the light, sanctified, made holy, forgiven. And another title is saints. Now, I know that there are religions and, and uh, you know, groups that, that name certain people as saints. And then there's just the rest of us, you know. In the Bible, if you are saved, you're a saint. So I'm looking at St. Andy over here. 
he's sitting right by St. Chris. And I see St. Vlado and St. Kathy, St. Tom. I'm St. Mark. We're all saints, right? We're called saints by the Word of God. That's because we've come to Christ. We have been sanctified. That's what it means. Now let's look at synonyms for the lost. Condemned. Damned. Unrighteous. Blinded. Children of darkness. Deceived. Rebels. Unbelievers. Sinners. Unholy. Estranged. Ungodly. Children of wrath. Children of the wicked one. Then the saddest word of all, lost. 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 That's a sad word. The results of the judgment, when it comes to the end, is first of all, are you saved or are you lost? But think about this. There is a replacement for your judgment. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God. Now we've talked about the justness of God. We've talked about His justness. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, this is how we know God loves us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now this is a theological concept that is judicial in nature, and what it's saying here is because God is just and holy and good, sin must be paid for. There is a penalty for that sin. But God's love gave us His Son so that He could pay the penalty for you and for me. In other words, when it comes to salvation, grace does this. This is what grace does. Grace looks at and treats Jesus as if he lived my life. And grace looks at and treats me as as if I lived Jesus' life. That is grace because it is undeserved, it is unmerited favor. Let's look at the next verse with this, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, that is God the Father, hath made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what the Bible is saying is this, the replacement of our judgment is I stood guilty before God, I stood before him unworthy. I stood before him unclean. And Jesus came and he paid my penalty so that I could be seen by God as if I were his son and God would see his son as if he were me. And that happened on the cross. That happened on the cross. And that is what Jesus dreaded when he was in the garden and he was sweating as it were great drops of blood, and he prayed, if it be possible, Lord, let this cup pass from me. It wasn't fear of the physical pains of the cross, as terrible as they may have been. It wasn't the, the, the shame. It wasn't the, the, the hardship that he went through. It was drinking that cup of the sins of the whole world that Jesus dreaded. And when he brought that into his soul, into his heart, he became sin, and the heavens grew dark, and the Father turned his face away from his own son and Jesus said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and at that moment this is what this happened right here he became me he became you but thank God what happened is that means that we became righteous in his name he gave us a transferred righteousness by taking our penalty the replacement of our judgment if we're going to worship Christ If we're going to lift him high, we're going to use words that have to do with who he is. And we're going to use words like Lord, which means owner and master. But one of the most beautiful words that we use when we talk about Jesus is we use the word Savior. Savior, because he saved us. He did what it took to bring us back to God. He is our Savior. And listen, the the, the greater the word Savior means is made greater when we understand how terrible sin is 
and how condemned we actually are. And those who minimize sin and those who minimize punishment and those who minimize hell or or disregard hell, they take all meaning away from the word Savior. Saved from what? Listen, if we're not saved from sin, what are we saved from? If we're not saved from condemnation, what are we saved from? If we're not saved from hell, what are we saved from? Why even use the word Savior if it has no meaning? It has great meaning. And the meaning is great because the sin is of such a magnitude that being saved is so wonderful. Uh, I think of, of a man on, on death row. And the governor has the power to, uh, to free him. Maybe he was guilty, maybe he wasn't. But the governor looks at his situation and he says, I'm going to give that man a pardon. Now, do you think that when they come to him and maybe uh, at 12 o'clock he's scheduled to be executed, but, but at 11 o'clock someone comes to him with a pardon from the governor and he says, here, this is a pardon, you're free. Do you think his reaction would be, well, I was kind of looking forward to 12 o'clock? No, he'd be happy, he'd be overjoyed. He, he, he'd think, what a wonderful man the governor is. I think he'd want to go shake his hand. He'd want to say thank you. Uh, perhaps he'd want to do anything he could for the governor to express his gratitude. Why, for being free. I get to live. That would be a wonderful thing. Well, listen, multiply that by a billion times over, and that's how we should feel about being saved from the penalty of sin, because we're not just talking about execution. We're talking about eternity in the lake of fire, and Jesus came and took that for us so that we could be free. The replacement of our judgment. He took the penalty of your sins and mine upon his own body. He paid our sin debt, and he tasted death for every man. He died for the sins of the whole world. He satisfied the wrath of a holy God. Uh, Listen, if you end up having to stand before Christ without him as your Savior, then the only thing he can be for you is your judge. I'm thankful that when I stand before my Savior Jesus Christ... I may have a lifetime of things that I wish I'd done differently. I may have some works that I wish I'd performed that I didn't. I may have some things that I did that I wish I had not done. But I'm going to heaven because he took my penalty upon himself. But you know what that makes me want to do? It makes me want to love him. It makes me want to serve him. It makes me want to get to heaven and find out that maybe I've got some gold and silver and precious stones. Maybe I've got some things I sent on before. Uh, This world is temporary. That world is forever. We need to be investing in it. That is where our judgment is. If you sincerely accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior now in this life, you will be able to stand before him and have your life assessed as to your place in heaven. And uh, I don't know what that's going to be like. I don't know what that's going to be like. And I know there's a place in the Bible where it says God, and it's talking about the saved now. It's talking about the saved. God shall wipe the tears from their eyes. Now, now I think that means something. If God's going to wipe tears from your eyes, it means that the, the tears were there. The tears were there to wipe away. There was a time of sadness, a time of sorrow. But listen, if you're saved and you're standing before God, why are there tears? Well, there could be tears of joy for seeing him, but I don't think that's what it means here. I've got a theory. I've got a belief. It's it's not anything that I could say for definite, sure, but I do believe this. I can't imagine standing before Jesus and seeing those nail prints in his hands and knowing what he did for me and knowing how little I did for him and how I've let him down and how I've failed to meet the mark and not weep. I don't think any of us are going to be able to stand before Jesus dry-eyed. I don't think any of us are going to be able to have our lives evaluated. And the Bible says every idle word and every secret thing. I don't believe any of us are going to stand there dry-eyed before our, our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. But there's going to be a time when the evaluation is complete and the rewards are met and the, 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 the wood and the hay and the stubble of our Fleshly works are all burned away, gone. God's going to wipe the tears from our eyes. We're not going to weep over them forever. Listen, heaven wouldn't be heaven if we had to cry all the time. Heaven wouldn't be heaven if we had to weep all the time because of regret. We're going to deal with it. There's going to be an assessment. There's going to be a judgment. But then he's going to wipe all the tears away from our eyes, and heaven's going to be a wonderful place. I just believe that. I believe that. 
And you can say, well, give me chapter and verse. Well, I've given you a few, but this is, this is my, my speculation. I just believe that when Jesus wipes the tears away from our eyes, it's because they were there. And the only thing I can think of is in the judgment that that's what it'll be. There will be a time to come in the end times when this whole thing is wrapped up. In Matthew 25, 41, here's what we're going to hear from Jesus. Some are going to hear this. Some are going to hear this. Not the saved, but the lost. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what he's going to say to people who are lost. The judge, the righteous judge of all the earth is going to say that. Now, to those who were within Christianity but never made it personal, to those who maybe called themselves Christians, maybe even they were baptized, maybe even they joined a church, maybe even they went to Sunday school, and maybe even they sat and heard sermon after sermon, but they never really made it real for them. They never made it personal. Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's in Matthew 7, 23. There will be those who said, who will say, we did great works in your name. And he'll say, I never knew you. Now think with me. Even within the realm of Christendom, those who claim to, to honor and revere and even worship Jesus, there will be many who will be false believers and not go to heaven because they never made it real in their hearts. They never truly repented before God. They never truly submitted to Him in the gospel. If you, having been warned, give rest to your soul and fail to tremble at the thought of standing before the judge of all the earth, you have shown Him great disrespect. You have referred to God as a liar. You have thought of Him as some kind of fool and some kind of chump. Listen, God today sits on the holy throne of judgment, and He also sits on the holy, wonderful throne of grace, and He offers grace to all who will come to Him, and it's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and therefore when people are condemned, they will have no excuse. They will have no excuse. God has given you enough revelation. God has given you enough leading. God has given you enough information so that the truly repentant and contrite heart could come to Him for salvation. We are to tell the good news with the confidence that God is directing it and God is moving it where it should go. If you can go day to day, <clears throat> week by week, month to month, year to year, without an urgent and compelling desire to repent and come to Christ, then you are among the lost. You are comfortable in it. You are fine with that. But your doom is coming. If, on the other hand, your soul is under conviction, and if the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart about your need for salvation, and you're concerned about your eternal destiny, then it's not too late to sincerely call on the name of Jesus for salvation. And He will abundantly pardon He'll take away your sins. He'll give you a new heart. Uh, he'll give you a new life, a new way of thinking, a new way of living. He'll give you His Holy Spirit within to walk with you and talk with you. Listen, one of the things about the Holy Spirit within is, is He gives you hope. He gives you joy. He gives you love. He lets you know when you're doing wrong, and He lets you know when you've got it right, and there's sweet fellowship. Listen, the Holy Spirit is our daily companion. The question comes, are you ready for judgment? Are you ready for the judgment day? What changes might we as Christians make to make that evaluation that we have better? What are we laying up in heaven? What are we doing on earth that makes an impact for heaven? One man put it this way, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? And I think that's a good way of saying it. What on earth are we doing for heaven's sake? That is the evaluation that we will have. One time I was preaching this concept about the gold and the silver and the precious stones uh, that will be evaluated. And, and for the Christian, our works will be evaluated by fire. And uh, the Bible says that we'll have gold and silver precious stones that will endure the fire. And then there's wood, hay, and stubble that the fire will burn up and that will be evaluated as to our good works and will be rewarded accordingly. And I had a man come forward in tears. 
And so I met him at the altar and, and uh, I talked with him and, and he said, I never knew that. I thought it was just either heaven or hell, just that, heaven or hell. He said, I never really understood the fact that, that, that I can make a difference of what kind of heaven I have and what kind of things that I can do to make heaven a, a, a better place or whatever, that I can actually make a difference, that what I do counts for something. Well, this truth that had overwhelmed him, something perhaps you and I have heard before and have accepted and are, and are, are used to it, this was new to him. And it moved him to tears to think, my life counts for something. I can make a difference. And you know what? That fellow began to be more active in church. He began to come to work days. He, he'd ask me, what can I do, pastor? Why? Because he was thinking what I could lay up over there, what I could make a difference for. That's a, a concept that should ever remain fresh for us. Our lives count for something. Listen, your life, I'm looking around here at our congregation, my wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ. You count. You count. You are one day going to stand before your boss, who is, by the way, a Jewish carpenter, and he's going to look you up and down, and he's going to review your life, your motives, your attitudes, your actions, your choices, and he's going to reward you accordingly as you have done. And the same goes for me. Listen, I know there's going to be some tears for all of us when we realize what we could have done and shouldn't have done and did. But listen, I know one thing. He's going to be so fair, so just, so holy, and so right. And none of us would even have a thought to question his righteous judgment. One thing I do stand in awe of is his amazing grace. That is the thing that shocks us. That is the thing that we can't fully comprehend. How could we, being so guilty and so away from His perfection, so away from His standard of righteousness, and yet be included in heaven forever? The only explanation is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is what we preach. That is what we have accepted. And that's what makes the difference in our lives. The judgment day is coming. It could be nearer than any of us knows. Dear Father... I pray that you would help us to live our lives knowing that one day we're going to stand before you and give an account. Lord, that should cause us to wake up. It should cause us to understand that our choices should be such that bring you glory. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for our frailty and our weaknesses and our lack of faith and, uh, Lord, our lack of following Lord, help us to stay closer. Help us to live more diligently for you. And Lord, I pray for the lost. There are so many lost in this country today, so many lost among our own relatives and friends. Lord, I pray for them that they would come to Christ before it's eternally too late. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.